Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. So this talk is about policy. It's not anything uber elite. We're not going to talk about using a bunch of DSs to crack SHA-1. Uh, we're not going to bring down DNS. We're not going to bounce around with DEP, ASLR, anything like that. It's just policy. That said, please don't leave. Because the thing with policy here is we're going to try to cover it without the politics, without the, the BS thrown into it. We're going we're gonna to do what we can on that front. But before we really dig into this, let me introduce myself. My name's Jim. I work for a Midwestern information security company, primarily doing breach investigations and penetration tests. Basically breaking into things and seeing how other people broke into things. Then I have a little bit of a compliance and policy thrown in there as well. To keep, my, to keep me humble. So one of the things that we do oftentimes when we are in the midst of these uh, breach investigations or penetration tests is we want to do a root cause analysis. We want to find out more than just, hey, we tricked a user into opening up a bad PDF document. Or, hey, look, you have a uh, web dev system that we were able to exploit. We want, to, we want to know what were the circumstances that led up to those actions being able to occur. In this practice, we often explain to customers that these individual issues are like cockroaches. And that when you see them, you got to kill them. You're not just going to let them live. You're not just going to let them just keep on crawling away. Each one matters. But there's circumstances in which these cockroaches thrive. And that's the same thing in the networks. When we come across these sorts of problems, when we find these uh, vulnerabilities we're able to exploit, or we come in after the fact and we find that the company has been hurt by a malicious outsider, the vector that that outsider was able to act upon, we want to find out how did that, how did that vector manifest itself. And most of the time, when we're doing these, the outcome of this comes out to be pretty consistent, to be a failure of policy. Which makes sense when you consider the fact that policy is foundational for the whole basis of the information security program. If you get the policy wrong, everything else past it is going to be wrong. Is going to have a cascading effect. In many respects, a lot of what we consider security technologies are nothing more than devices or software, practices that are in place to enforce policy. And if what you're enforcing is fundamentally wrong, what are you going to wind up with? And this is where I think as a community, we're not doing enough. Because we all want to do the cool work. We all want to do the interesting work. We all want to be ninjas. And that's good. You know, that, that's what keeps me going. There's a reason that a couple slides previous, I have breach investigations, penetration tests, nice and big, and compliance and policy small. It's because that's the work I enjoy doing. But in any position, you have work you want to do and work you have to do. And I think as a community, we're evading this work you have to do aspect of policy, which is a shame. A confession I'll make on this is um, I've got maybe about six or seven possible revisions of uh, the same presentation going back a long time, where I would get frustrated based upon the fact that we see these consistent policy failures across a number of organizations. And so as an outlet, I'd put this together. Then after I put it together, eh, it's, it's kind of gone past now. 
So after a while, it got to be it got to be too much. Where it's like, okay, I'm going to have to do more than just have this uh, self-fulfilling, you know, put, put my frustration down on paper and then go on. We got we got to share this out and see see what else we can do as a community because. I can't be the only one having this type of frustration. Because in, in our absence from this area, who is doing the work? Because it's obvious it's being done. And if it's not us doing it, who is? And what's their objectives? You know, what, why, why are they in there doing it? You know, is, is their objective security? Or is it something else? Is it compliance? And I wanted to get compliance out of the way really quick here. Because you can't really talk about policy without talking about compliance. They're very interconnected nowadays. Which, that's a real shame. Because compliance is not security. What compliance is, is compliance. Does that mean that compliance is bad? It's no. Compliance is what it is. But if you turn around and you base your information security program on compliance, you're going to have problems. And unfortunately, that's what a lot of organizations are doing. A reason for this is because compliance is something you can measure. Something you can have someone come into your organization, sit down, start going through checklists, mark off a bunch of boxes, and at the end of the day, hey, we're compliant. We've met our objective. How do you measure whether or not you're secure? It's not nearly as easy. You know, do you base it upon, have we been breached? Well, how do you know you haven't been breached? So, from a business standpoint, why would you not attach onto something like compliance where you can show the board of directors, look, we've met our objectives? This is where we need to step in. We need to do more than just get frustrated by this and sit around and complain about it. We need to step in and take some action. Because if we know so much, it's time for us to do something about it. From my perspective, policy has two faces, both a public and a private objectives. From a public objective, in its simplest form, I consider information security policies to be about protection of assets. Now, those assets could be of various forms. They could be ideas. They could be intellectual property. They could be systems. They could be people. But regardless, they're assets that have value to the company, and you need to protect them. And on the surface, this is what we'd like to think that our information security programs, our policies, are based upon. Then from the private objective, this is the more accurate standpoint of where we are. It's about CYA and liability transference. And that's what we wind up with with most policies, structures within various organizations. I was online not too long ago. I found this picture, which this really kind of uh, made me think of how most uh, policy structures are set up within organizations, which is unfortunate. Now, the people doing the work, are they screwing this up because they're evil? I think they just don't understand what they're doing. That's a crazy picture. But that's no crazier than the way most individuals see their jobs. They're given these objectives, they're given these compliance goals, these business directions, and they're not really being provided the tools to go after it. So how are they even in a position to deliver good quality policy? Again, we need to step in. We need to play an active role in this. The complexity of the issue can be really overwhelming. 
it can be tough for us. And we like to know that we know the space. We like to think we know this space. So how's a lay person, a business person, going to really navigate this? And what sort of a what sort of product are they going to wind up with? What are they going to deliver? It's going to be a mess. Again, why am I seeing the breaches I'm seeing? When I do a pen test, why do I get into an organization? It's because it's a mess. No one can make sense of what they're supposed to be doing. So you sit there and, and you're given this task, and so what are you going to do? You're going to fill the role that you see people expect you to fill. You're going to generate paperwork. You're going to have a lot of meetings. You're going to have minutes and uh, special task groups that you set up to study individual problems. And this whole echo chamber effect starts getting created. And then when a problem occurs, no one can say, you didn't do your job. Because look at all this documentation. Look at all these meeting minutes. Look how many hours you spent on the problem. Of course you took it seriously. So no one's going to blame you. So what, who winds up becoming the biggest driver within the organizations? Oftentimes, it's those with the biggest mouth and the most political weight. And they push their objectives. Not any, not any sort of security objectives. The other driver is an adverse event, which may have just occurred. <laughs> I'd be against robots. It, it's funny, but at the same time, you could argue that the last election was all about whether or not, as a society, we've overreacted to an adverse event that hit us as a people. And to say that it's not going to happen on smaller scales is ridiculous. When you're in that sort of emotional state, it's very easy to make decisions that you otherwise would not. And do you want that to be the driver? Is that going to make you more secure? So we wind up with a situation where our policy is not about security. Our policies are about what's easy to implement and meets compliance goals. And that's where we are today. Which, it doesn't have to be that way. But, for those responsible for doing this work, it shows that they've done their job. And if, if you're in that position and you need to go forward, what are you going to concentrate on? Is it going to be protecting your job or protecting the company? What's going to be your driver there? Where's your incentive? Your, your incentive is, has nothing to do with protecting the company. It has to do with making sure you maintain an income stream. Because who has been held liable for bad decisions? Again, liability transference. It's the employees that, get the, that take the hit. They take the bullet. Because if you go out there and you do something that's a little bit different than what's expected of you, it may be the right thing to do in the circumstance, but will the company stand behind you? And that, that's, that's rough. So why would you go out and do something other than what, what is expected? You know, one of the first things I hear when I work with individual companies on fixing their policy structures is they ask, what is everyone else doing? What is other healthcare industry providers doing? What are other blank companies doing? What are other companies our size doing? They don't care about what is right for me to do in my situation with my business objectives and my drivers and my goals set forth by the board of directors. It's what is everybody else doing? You wind up with a situation where you do what's visible, which is oftentimes something loud and expensive. Because people will notice it. It's not, it's not what's done 
what's the right thing to do. It's what will get noticed. Which brings me to the only time I'm going to throw numbers into this. But RSA did a, uh, did a poll, did a survey. It was quite lengthy. This is from 2008. But this is what jumped out at me, is they asked the question of the individuals, do you feel as if you have to break policy in the completion of your assigned duties? And 35% of the individuals said yes. And I look at that number, and I think, wait a minute. It has to be bigger than that. If it's 35%, it has to be bigger. Because these are 35% of the individuals that, A, know what their policy is, and B, are willing to admit to somebody that they break it on a regular basis. So, of course it's going to be larger than that. And if you have a situation where employees are having to break policy in the completion of their assigned duties, what do you have? It's a form of risk, risk acceptance. You're not coming out and saying we accept this risk. Instead, you're doing it and you're shifting the liability onto the employees instead of within the management structure where it belongs. And the reason this happens is because what's the employee going to do about it? They have to sign their annual statement of, of that they understand the policy in order to get their bonus. Oftentimes, they're probably not even going to read what that policy is. How good is the annual training? Do they have annual training? And so when we talk to these organizations and we tell them, look, you know, you got a problem. You need to fix your policy structure. Employees are having to, it, it's, it's, your policy structure is, is making your employees' jobs harder than they need to be. Oftentimes the response is, who cares? If they want to work under our roof, they're going to follow our rules. And to that, I, I call bullshit. And we'll use an example. We'll talk about removable storage. And it's very, very common for me to come across a policy statement that says, thou shalt not use removable storage. Oftentimes, they'll specifically call out USB drives. Some organizations will put in controls to prevent the use of these, this removable storage. Those controls may be anything from software that runs on the individual desktops down to hot glue gun filling up the USB ports. But they have a control. Other organizations put the line in the policy and move on because employees should follow the rules. But if you look at the situation, why, why are people wanting to use removable storage? Is it because they're evil and they want to steal all the IP from an organization and, and go running off with it? There's some cases like that, but they're edge conditions. Most of the time, the reason they want to use removable storage is because they have to work on off hours. They have a job to do. And is it because employees love to work at home? I haven't seen any organization that's hiring individuals that just love to work from home on a regular basis. But what's happening is, is the employees have an incentive structure. They have expectations set up for them as far as what work is going, need, going to need to be done by what times. They have deadlines. And think of this situation. You have a kid. The kid has a soccer game at 5.30. You need to take the kid to the soccer game at 5.30. You have work that needs to be done for a 9 a.m. meeting. It's only going to take a few hours, but it's already lunchtime. And you know, if you need to bring the kid to the soccer game at 5.30, you're going to have to leave the house by 5, which means you're going to have to take about 15 minutes to get the kid ready. So you're going to have to be home by roughly 4.30, and it's going to take you about an hour to drive home. So you need to leave the office by about 3.30. You should probably shoot for like about 3.15, 3 o'clock in order to get the kid to the soccer game at 5.30. So you have a choice to make. Is your kid going to miss the soccer game? And you're going to stay at work? and finish the job and have it all ready by the 9 a.m. meeting? Or are you going to throw it on a thumb drive, go home, take the kid to soccer, come back, 
get dinner together, and then sit down and work on it a little bit in the evening, finish it up, turn it in the next morning, and everybody's happy. Nobody's going to ask any questions. What's your incentive? Because at the end of the day, the problem is not removable storage. The problem is the ability to work off-site. And have you addressed that problem in your policy statement? I would argue no. What a lot of this comes down to is what are individuals' incentive structures? And we're not, we're not taking those into account when we're generating these policies. And there's not just one uh, incentive structure. Employees, what do they want? They want a raise. They want a promotion. They want Friday to come quicker. They want to get as little work done without anyone noticing. What's the manager's incentive? Get as much work out of the employees as possible so that they don't have to increase their payroll expenses. The company, they want to increase value for the shareholders. And then security within the organization? They're the only one that's concerned about security for security's sake. So where is the incentive? So we wind up with a situation where we build the structure, liability is shifted down to the user, to the employee, and when something adverse happens, they're the one that gets blamed. Everyone's going to look the other way when the employee takes that drive home, works on it in the evening, and turns it in the next day. Nobody's going to ask any questions. But if something went wrong, that USB key is lost and there's some credit card, social security numbers, whatever, that wind up being put online, a lawsuit's brought against the company, who's going to take the hit? It's not really going to be the company. The employee's going to get fired because they broke the policy. From my perspective, that's abusive. Because we're setting up expectations for the employees, but we're not giving them the tools necessary to meet those goals. Policy has to be more than just what not to do. And that's, in a sense, what it pretty much is on most of them that I see. So going back to the previous example, what can we do? We can deny users the ability to use that USB drive, and we can adjust our expectations. We can say, look, we're going to take a productivity hit. It's going to take us a little bit longer to get work done from employees if they're not working from remote. And that's OK. We're willing to take that hit, because this is a security issue, and we're not willing to accept the risk, and we're going to do that. It's perfectly valid. Or we can say, look, in this economy, we're not really willing to slow down our productivity. We don't want to bring in additional employees. So we're going to accept that there's going to be some risk. We're going to provide employees an accepted method to work from remote. So that they, they have this incentive already to get their work done. Let's give them a tool to meet that incentive. What you wind up with in that case is a policy program that's enabling, that helps the user meet their incentives. The other aspect of this is uh, when you're building policy, you have to realize that people are lazy. There's nothing wrong with that. That's human nature. You can bash your head against the wall and fight against that, but you're just expelling a lot of effort. Take the fact that people are lazy, embrace it, use it to your advantage. And this really is the most important point here, is we need to take into account why do employees need to work within the policy? What incentive do they have to work within the policy structure? We need to make it easier to work inside the policy structure than outside.
using the fact that people are lazy to our advantage. Water runs downstream. You can use that to your advantage, or you can try to redirect it somehow, which is going to be more costly. Other issue here is consumers versus the enterprise. And this is something that I'm seeing a lot as well, where, especially with long time established companies, where they have certain expectations on how they're going to operate their IT infrastructure. And those ideas are based upon the fact that some time ago, all the new product development was really in the enterprise, because that's where most of the money was being spent. That's shifted over the years, and the consumer space is spending a lot more money than they ever used to on these sorts of devices. And so you have this functionality that's being provided to employees when they're not in the office that they come to expect. And I'm still always surprised when I go into an organization and I see they're still running some version of Exchange with a 700 meg quota. And the, the, the users that are using that system, they have 7 gig from Gmail. Why can't the office provide them with something at least comparable? People get used to these, this level of service, this level of, of, of products that, that cater to them. And so when they go into the office, they expect the same thing. And a lot of companies are not addressing that. And if you don't address that, what you wind up with a situation where people work around the obstacles you put in place. And from my perspective, it's better to have a known risk than an unknown risk. So you need to look at this functionality that your employees are expecting and say, can we provide this in an acceptable manner within the company? Maybe yes, maybe no. But if the answer is no, you have to clearly explain why users don't have this. You can't just mandate it. You can't just tell them no. You have to give them a reason. It's harder work, but if you really care, you have to do it. Other aspect. Policy is often punitive. And that's not a... Anyone that has kids know that if you sit around and you tell them what's going to happen to them if they don't do what you tell them to do, all it does is make them sneaky. I'm sure a lot of people in this room can appreciate that fact. You get good at evading controls if you don't believe in those controls. You have to deal with incentive structures. Is the incentive of not getting in trouble enough to make people do what you want them to do? But that's how most organizations are structured. That's not, that's not good enough. When you're building out the policy, you have to make sure that you're willing to enforce everything you put in it. This is another thing that just blows my mind where I come into an organization and we start going through their policy and they say, look, we want to put this into the policy. We're not ready to implement it yet, but we want it in there so that that way when we are ready, it's, it's already there for us and we don't have to go through our policy review and acceptance cycle again. Is it okay if we do that? No. You can't do that. If you have things in your policy that you're not willing to enforce, you've just invalidated the entire policy. Why does anyone think you're going to enforce any aspect of it if you're, not, if you're selectively enforcing some aspects and not others? That's a bad idea. No, of course you can't do that. Again, accepting risk is okay. Our job is not to eliminate risk. You could argue that a lot of the highest return endeavors are very high risk. You have to decide what is your risk threshold and how are you going to work towards it? How are you going to do that as an organization? And unfortunately, people have been, struck, have been, been beat up to a certain extent where they're afraid to say we accept this risk because they're afraid that when something goes wrong it's going to be their butt on the line and they're them in the unemployment line afterwards. So we have, to, we have to address that, and that's a very difficult thing. It's a very cultural 
sort of thing. And if you want to keep some degree of uh, leetness to this, when you're working in any of this area, just consider it social engineering your organization. You're not just getting past one or two people. You're altering the entire structure of the organization. How can you make your organization realize that with your eyes open and truly evaluating the circumstances, accepting a certain amount of risk is fine. You have to address, in the policy structures, you have to address the problem, not the symptoms. The symptoms is the use of removable storage. The problem is employees need a way to work off-site. The problem, or the symptom, is individuals using open Wi-Fi. The problem is secure remote access. How can you address the problem in your policy and not the individual symptoms? Because you're going to have an infinite number of symptoms. Earlier this morning, there's a whole, uh, we heard the concept of the whitelist versus the blacklist. I think that's, that's, that's excellent because there's an infinite amount of bad things that can occur. But there's only so many good things. So how do you concentrate on those good actions? You have to address what, what are people's incentives and why are they engaging in the activities in which they are. And you have to address that within the policy structure. I keep saying this incentive aspect of it, but it's because I can't overstate that. Because people are ignoring that. Why? Why do you expect the user to follow your policy? How is it in their interest to do so? Do they have any incentive to do it? Have you made it so that it's easier to do the right thing than the wrong thing? And th this is an issue from everything, from interface design to policy, whatever. I mean, this is an ongoing, consistent issue. But, and it, it's tough. It's tough to find the right answer to. But you have to at least make an attempt for your organization. You can't just ignore it and say, hey, it's hard, so I'm going to go on to do other things. That's just being lazy. You have to let your employees know what outcomes are expected of them. And you have to provide them the tools to reach those outcomes. Again, that's something that's sadly missing from most policy structures that I come across. There's nothing wrong with best practices, but they're nothing more than a starting point. If you blindly implement them across your organization, you're going to have problems. All they are is really just a set of uh, least common denominators. And is that really good enough? No, they're just a starting point. You take them and then you go on from there. There's going to be some concepts that are generally accepted as best practices that don't apply at all to your organization. Throw them out. Just because they're best practices doesn't mean they're right for you. There's going to be others that you need to take and build upon. What are your business objectives? What is your risk threshold? What are your incentives? What are you trying to do as an organization? Those are all things that you have to temper best practices with. Here's the deal is, realistically, policy is one of the highest rate of return items that you can do to improve security to an organization. It may be one of the hardest. It may be one of the most boring. It may be one of filled with a ton of heartache because of who you're dealing with. But if you really want to make a difference, this is how you're going to make lasting difference in the organization. And I'll tell you, one of my frustrations with this field we all work in for a long time has been, I look, uh, my grandfather, he was an iron worker. And I can go around town, I come from Omaha, I can go around town and I can look and I can see, hey, there's the sundial in the zoo that he made. You know, here's the sign at this, at this company that is still up there. You know, he, he's been dead and in the ground for years. But things that he's worked on are still around town. 
Do they make a difference in people's lives on a day-to-day -day basis that they notice? No. But his mark is still there. I've, I've been in this field for a long time now, and one of the frustrating aspects of it is anything you're working on today is more than likely going to be gone in three years. So how do you leave your mark? And I would argue that policy is where you really can. Because organizations, they gain momentum. Once they have a certain idea that's part of the corporate culture, whether it's a large company or a small company, it's very difficult to change that. Which means it's going to be very difficult to make the changes within the policy structure that you need to make within the organization. But once it's done, once it's in there, it's going to stay for a long period of time. Do you really want to make a mark? If so, this is where you do it. Do you really want to help your company? If so, this is where you do it. I'm not saying you should ignore anything else. I'm not saying the, the fun stuff isn't fun, it isn't cool. But the question is, you know, why are you here? Why is this the field that you've decided to work? I hear a lot of people tell me that they're in this field because they want to help. They want to improve security. They want to do this. And they, they, they spout out these very altruistic reasons. But, you know, is, is that really true? You know, or did you just want someone to pay for your toys? You know, and I appreciate someone else paying for my toys. But if you're going to be using these reasons, these I'm in it for the greater good reasons, then put up or shut up. Questions? Yeah. So how do you counter? So how do you how do you counter the question of uh, that's posed to you about what are other companies in my industry doing? What are other companies in my um, size doing? You try to approach it. Uh, with a with a degree of tact, um, because you can't just come out and say, "Are you retarded for asking me that question?" You know, you're not going to keep a customer that way, and they're not going to listen to anything that comes out of your mouth. Instead, what what you have to do is you have to explain to them that a little bit about what these other organizations are doing, but then start talking to them about what makes their company unique. To a degree, you have to play to their ego, because everybody wants to think they're they're the lead in their own story, right? You know, you you play to that. You make sure that they they understand that their organization is not the same as every other organization out there under the sun. It's not the same just because you're a retailer doesn't mean that you're in the same situation as every other retailer out there. Maybe you're operating in different markets. Maybe you're operating with different types of products. You have a different type of clientele. You have to understand that. And again, it gets back to the fact that this isn't all about the tech side of this. You have to understand business objectives and so on and so forth. And that, that's what you start talking to with the customer. That's what you have to engage them in so that they, they understand why. You know, it, it's the same as, as my point about explaining to users why it's in their interest to work within this policy structure. You have to explain to, to the customer, to, to, the, to the company, why is it in their interest to provide this degree of care within their policy structure? How can it benefit them? And what could be the possible consequences if they don't? I think I saw that hand there first. What other companies are doing? One of the reasons companies ask what other companies are doing is... Um, because of the legal definition of uh, due diligence mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. liability therefrom. But you know, the r main problem I have is with budgets and yep. getting a security budget out of other departments with other priorities. Do you have any guidelines for that? Well, when, when you're dealing with the policy side of things, ideally um, it's not going to be a infosec budget you're having to deal with. It's, you're not, we're not talking about things that are consistently the purchase of new technology and new processes and, and, and that sort of thing. It, the, the real grunt work in this is understanding why is the company structured the way it is, why, again, the business objectives, 
what are the employees, uh, why are they approaching the job the way they are. It's a lot of personnel time. It's not necessarily a product, which again makes it more difficult because a product you can purchase, you can put in place, you can hit a checkbox, and you can say done. Now we just need to maintain our annual maintenance contract. You know, and that, that's, it doesn't really do the job, but you know, it's appealing. So, yeah, I mean, budgets, they're always going to be a concern, and, and they always have been a concern. Um, but you, you, you first deal with it from, from that perspective, from the policy perspective. And then as you're dealing with the policy, going back to the, to the removable storage, setting up an acceptable method for individuals to work from home, that may cost some money. That may be some product that needs to be purchased. But that decision to purchase that, dis that hardware, purchase that technology, is part of that policy decision-making process. Do you care enough about providing that, that type of functionality to the individuals? If you don't care enough to spend that money, then you're going to option A, which is a, say no, you're not allowed to do it, and adjust your expectations. Neither one of those is a wrong answer. It's just a matter of what is appropriate for that organization. So budget, should it really be a budget decision at that point? Everything's about money. Uh, but I, I think if you approach it from that perspective where you have these choices, these different solutions to the problem, and then you pick the one that's appropriate, budget is secondary then at that point because you've already made that decision as part of that policy decision. Here comes the mic. Uh, first of all, I want to say it's a great talk. I'm one of those people who groans every time I see an attachment from a policy person in my inbox, so uh, Thank you. it actually appeals to me as a technical asset. Um, I want to say that my favorite phrase to describe this is that the technology is easy, but the culture is hard. And a lot of the dialogue I end up having, having with my policy people is about the controls we put in place. Mm -hmm. How do we make it easier to do the right thing mm -hmm. than it is to do, to do the wrong thing? Um, and that's really the only common ground in terms of mindset we have in common is here is our policy. Now, what are our technical controls we can put in place? Uh, and I've, I struggle sometimes in trying to speak in the same language and finding collaborative uh, venues in that way. Could you talk a little bit about taking the policy, what's the right thing to do, and how to design uh, from there? What, what is an adequate technical control? Uh, how much diligence do you want to do to make sure they can't do that no matter how hard they try? Or just enough to make it more difficult than following the policy? Or? That's a horrible question because it's very difficult to answer. So. Because that, that, your question is, is spot on because that's where you spend most of your time when you're engaging with an organization that is willing to approach this from, at, at this mature level. Uh, how do you know what, what is appropriate? How do you know how much effort to put in, in, in place to make it difficult to overcome the controls? And, and, and my, my standpoint is why would the user want to bypass the controls. Can you structure it in such a way where you've removed that incentive? If, if, if the problem is the individual needs to work from remote and you've provided them with an accepted, in policy, easy to use method, then why would they work outside of it? What other goal did you not take into account when you designed that, that initial process? And if you've miss something, maybe the landscape has changed, you know, that happens. You have to be willing to update your policy possibly more than once, once a year. You have to make sure you have good breakdowns between what's the difference between a policy, a guideline, a standard, and so on and so forth. You, you have to have that structured and, and, and flexible to deal with the, with the changing landscapes. But why does that user not want to work within that structure? And, and when that comes up, uh, you have to look at what you missed. Uh, I, hope, I hope I'm answering your, your, your question because it basically comes down to is the control one that the user could bypass? Possibly yes. Possibly it could be trivial to bypass, but why would they? And if you can, if you can approach it and build a structure where they, you've removed that why question, why would they do this, then you're on your way to success. You just have to be willing 
to address it on a frequent basis. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Well, yeah, that, that's tough. And, and you know, part of this is, is um, sometimes we have these large organizations where we don't understand what these individuals' jobs, what their jobs really are. And, and so how do you provide them a process that is going to be useful to them when we don't even understand what they're trying to accomplish? And, and that happens constantly. And there's really no substitute to understanding, to sitting down and understanding exactly what that employee's job is and how can I make it easier within the policy framework so that they don't want to work outside of it. And, you know, unfortunately, sometimes you have individuals that are just very difficult to work with and they're going to be obstinate just for the sake of it. And in those circumstances, is there anyone else within the organization that has a similar position that you could work with them instead? And, you know, if you have that, that sort of obstacle of an employee, not to be crass, but in a lot of circumstances, do they need to be an employee? You know, are, are they making situations very difficult? You know, and, and, and sometimes when you're addressing these types of problems, you shake out individuals that are not engaged as part of the company, and then you have to address them from that perspective, which is only possible if you have a good champion on your side that's driving these, the, 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 this policy discussion anyhow. So it may or may not even be something you can accomplish, but you get as close as you can, which is oftentimes an improvement over where you are. And so as long as each time you address the problem, you get further and further into a good solution, then it's helped. One of the things I've run into in my career time and time again is that the business is on the side of security when it's protecting them. But every once in a while you run into these scenarios where when security and business are directly opposed, mm -hmm. you kind of get that sort of steel cage match going on. Without fail, the business always wins. And I know that can be a little demoralizing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you come across this. Any thoughts or ideas on how when you end up with that, to do it the secure way goes completely against the business way, and the business way always wins because the business way makes money. Yeah, and, and that's, that's a very common situation, and one that will wind up uh, being consistent once it's implemented until an adverse event occurs, and then you'll flip back into that stage where an adverse event is, is driving the changes to policy, and you'll swing too far the other way. Yeah, and, and that's totally true. You know, there's a reason that penetration tests work the way they do. You know, are they comprehensive? Do they identify every single vulnerability within the company and every single way of exploiting an organization? No, but what they do is they provide a company real tangible issues, real tangible risks that you hand them, look, I've read your email, you know, and, and that makes, makes it seem more real to them. You know, so th they work from that perspective. The idea of the business going to be the driver, I think that gets back to what is the, the business objectives of the organization. Why are they in business? What are their drivers? What does the board of directors want? And realistically, from my perspective, there's nothing wrong with doing it the insecure way if that's what the organization wants to do and this is, they do it with their eyes open. And, and that's really the key is doing it with their eyes open because people will deny the risk because, again, they're risk adverse. They don't want to say, you know, no risk is acceptable. Lay it out. Make sure that they understand what it is that they're about to implement. And if this is the business decision that they want to make, they will live with the consequences. It's documented and it's their names down on it. It may be the right decision. Because I, I love the analogy of uh, jumping out of an airplane is only risky if you have a parachute on. If you don't have a parachute on, it's a zero risk endeavor. You, yeah. you, you, there's, no, there's no probability of one way or the other. You know what's going to happen. And, and that's, that, that's the way you, you have to, you, you deal with risk is it's what makes life fun. You know, there's a reason that high risk things are, are enjoyable. You know, and, and so you just do it with your eyes open and accept it.
Is there another question? Um, I had more of a comment, really. Uh -huh. I was just going to say, like, regarding your question, like, document the hell out of it mm -hmm. when you have a situation like that because memories have a way of changing a lot. <laughs> yep. Yep. And, uh, you know, when sometimes it's worth it to lose a battle if it wins you the war. You know, you've got something where you go head to head with, you know, the, the, the business side of your, your company, you know, and, and uh, you know, if, in, if it turns out that, oh, well, you were correct all along and now we're, now we're in a, uh, you know, a bit of trouble because of that, you know, we didn't go with your recommendation, and you're able to look back and say, okay, well, this is what I said, you know, and this is, you know, and I, I put in these emails and, I, I, you know, I have it here, I, these were my recommendations, you went against them in pursuit of greater profits. Mm -hmm. and now you're reaping what you sowed, yep. right, then, you know, you're going to build up that credibility with your, you know, with your upper management and the ownership of the company where they say, well, he was right here, he was right here, you know, maybe, maybe we'll go with his side, you know, the next mm -hmm. time that we have one of these uh, uh, steel cage matches, like you're saying. In some ways, it's like making, you know, sometimes you have to let the kid touch the stove before you let the kid right. Yeah, oh, that, that's totally true. There's a reason that retreat is a perfectly valuable valid military strategy. You know, you, you fight the wars that you can win. One other thing I want to throw out here, I don't have a slide on it, but I want to throw this out, is I do a lot of reading for various other risk theory. And one of the things I've come across that I find to be very interesting is the whole idea of risk compensation. And it basically goes along the lines of individuals have a certain level of risk that they're willing to accept and they're going to engage in activity that meets that risk level regardless of anything else surrounding them. And if you think about change control in a lot of organizations, change control is often referred to as brakes. Brakes are a performance tool on the car. They're not a safety tool. They allow you to go faster because you can stop quicker has nothing to do with safety, has to do with performance. Same thing with change control. Change control is about building in the ability to make changes to the organization in a quicker manner. And so is it really about uh, reducing risk at that point? If you install antivirus on your system and you believe that antivirus actually works, you know, God help you, then what you may be willing to download this program, this random program you found on the internet, and run it because you're trusting your antivirus is actually going to protect you. Where if you didn't have antivirus, you may have never engaged in that activity. So are you better off? Are you more safe at that point with antivirus installed? Are you roughly the same? Are you less safe? There's, that's, that's an example. There's a lot of other areas along this, this that, that you have to look at. And one, the idea of risk compensation, it's mainly driven, if you're interested in it, an uh, individual by the name of John Adams out of the UK. He deals with um, road safety issues. He's a, he often argues for the repeal of uh, safety belt laws because he, he feels that safety belt laws actually make people less safe. And he has a lot of interesting commentary about that. I think that there's a lot of ideas in risk compensation theory we can apply to our own organizations and the way we address policy, the way we address risk within the organizations. And it's definitely worth looking at. It's probably would be a good basis for a whole other talk uh, because you could go on at quite length of it. But it's just something I wanted to throw out there if anyone is interested in doing some research on their own about it. Any other topics or any comments, questions? Then I suppose we're good. <laughs>